when we deforest, we we use this incredibly effective tool called fire. What happens after that is that the above ground carbon is released and the below ground carbon continues to be released over the next 30 odd years. So when we cut down a forest and put cows on that land, we've immediately uh, emitted all this uh, carbon. So we've stripped the carbon out of pretty much all the grazing lands on earth just by grazing animals. Hi, this is Sierra from Eat for the Earth, and I'm here with Gerard Wedderburn Bishop. He's an environmental scientist from Queensland, Australia. Gerard, could you tell us a bit more about your background? Yeah, my background was with uh, state government in uh, Queensland. We were monitoring tree clearing with satellite imagery. So I got to see firsthand the impact industrial agriculture it was quite dis distressing to see how much deforestation was going on for industry. Over that period of, of 30 years of satellite monitoring, we recorded a thousand hectares per day being wiped out, being destroyed over 30 years. And 93% of it was for beef and sheep production. Australia is unique in that it's a first world country, but our tree clearing, our deforestation is still very much uh, as in the, the, the developing countries. So um, it was just, you could say breathtaking, you could say saddening. We, we were distraught in the end. You'd be driving along uh, with the laptop on your lap, coding or logging uh, data in the field sites and it was just kilometre after kilometre of new clearing from the year before. To give you an idea of how much that is, most people, they see a suburb going in maybe, and they see um, maybe uh, five or 10 square kilometres of trees cleared for that suburb. And they think that's distressing. That's a huge amount of, of trees. But in our state alone, this is not the whole of Australia, this is just Queensland, we were seeing 10 square kilometres destroyed every day. Wow. 90% for beef production. So we humans are at a tipping point right now. We're at a point where if we keep harming the environment, we won't have a home for ourselves, uh, let alone our children or their children. So um, th this is a critical point. This is a critical point. And this is happening right under our noses, caused by what we eat. Seeing that firsthand made me realise we can't keep doing this. So I left government and um, started writing, started talking. When you were working in the government, did you ever try to express any opinions to fellow scientists and did you get any pushback? When you're a government scientist, you can't speak out. You can't talk to the media without permission from the minister. So once I was out of government, uh, the gag comes off. The government units that look after this sort of thing, um, ours was a drought unit. It was uh, working basically for the farmers to tell them when the droughts were happening and how much feed was on the land for their cattle, and as well as mapping deforestation. What our job was, was working for the farmers. And that's a culture that's in many, many different governments around the world that they see themselves as a support for industry, not as a regulator for the environment. That's the heart of the problem. I left government um, in protest. Um, I saw a report that had been written by even some of my staff that was a greenwashing of the Queensland beef industry. I hit the roof. I, I challenged my boss and then her boss and walked out I, and never went back. Um, it was disgusting to, to me to see that government was so tightly involved in supporting industry and not supporting the environment, which is our future. It's a cultural thing. Generations before us saw that clearing the land, making room for agriculture was the best thing they could do for their families, for their income, for their future, for the country. But now We've got to change that. We've got to totally rethink everything about planet Earth because if, if we harm the planet's health, it will harm us. If we destroy the forest, we destroy our future. It's as simple as that. While in the past, it may have been, it may have seen that the forests were unlimited. We now know that the forests are definitely not. We are destroying them at a rate that is just beyond belief. The tropical deforestation, particularly that's going on today, is destroying the Amazon at a rate that is unprecedented. 
In the last 20 years, it's doubled. 85% of the Amazon deforestation is for beef production and for feed production for uh, livestock. And the problem with this is that we reach ecological tipping points. The Amazon is a really good example. Scientists have been saying for years that once 20% of the Amazon is cleared, that will change the water cycles. See, what happens is that the forests create their own rain. And they call this the river in the sky. And it's created by moisture that's pushed up by the forest and, it's, and the volatile organic compounds create the rain droplets that then make it rain. So the Amazon creates its own rain. And that water, that rain then turns south over the Brazil and other countries and creates an incredibly productive agriculture for them so that they can grow crops, rain-fed crops, two, three times a year, which is very, very productive. But it all depends on that rain. And now we've reached that tipping point so that in the last few years, the Amazon is beginning to have droughts. And the experts who've studied this for a long time are telling us that most of the Amazon will revert to savanna because it doesn't have the natural rainfall without the rainforest generated rainfall to, to sustain itself. So we could see in, our li in your lifetime, we could see the Amazon die. This is ecological collapse. We've got to totally rethink how we live. And the biggest impact we have is what we eat. If you look at uh, mining, for example, mining covers a small fraction, just 0.2% of the land, whereas agriculture covers 70%. It, it's, there's no comparison. You, you can't say that, that mining uh, stacks up uh, uh, against agriculture at all. And most of the land for agriculture is for animal agriculture. The, the, the interesting thing is that the 2019 IPCC report did some really interesting calculations on how we harvest our planet for food and for other things such as uh, fiber, cotton. 85% of the food that we eat by dry weight, they dry it out and measure the weight, is from crops for humans, right? Mm -hmm. And crops for humans take up just about 6% of the planet, whereas red meat production takes up 37%. And that gives us just 12% of our food. So tiny percentage of food is ravaging a large percentage of the planet. So people don't make that association much, but we are killing our planet just for red meat and dairy particularly, but also the other meats. They're incredibly inefficient. The, the most efficient meat that we eat is chicken. And if you eat chicken, it's as though you were lining up six bowls of pasta in front of you, eating one bowl and tossing out the rest. The wastage in eating meat is ridiculous. We cannot survive that. In fact, uh, some years ago, more than a decade ago, a study was done on the food on this planet, and they worked out that we can support an extra 4 billion people using less than the cropland that we're using now, because half the crops go to feed animals, not humans. So if we turn that back to humans, we can feed another 4 billion people. There's no issue with lack of food on this planet. The, the issue is the efficiency of the system. And by eating beef, for example, 96% of the protein that that cow took in is wasted. The inefficiency of meat eating is, is ridiculous. That efficiency is in land, water, air, forests. It's, it's the planet's future. So we, we've got to change. In fact, we are at a point where we must change our diet. It's not a matter of personal choice anymore. It's a choice for the future of us on this planet. We are trashing nature to produce meat and dairy. If we did not eat those things, we would have half the planet reverted back to nature habitat. Mm -hmm. We would solve the biodiversity crisis and that extra habitat would grow trees again it had solved the climate crisis. It would draw down the carbon dioxide into the vegetation again, like it used to. So we can solve species extinction, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis just by changing what we eat. And we're going to hit a brick wall. We will be given no choice in the end. It's not our choice. It's something we must do to survive as a species. What is the most 
disturbing statistic or thing you've personally witnessed in your career? I'm a director of a, a local tree planting group called Replant Byron. We're going to plant 1.8 million trees to offset the emissions from the agriculture in that small area. The last meeting we had, we had 20 people around a table and it was all very, very positive and useful for, to move forward with. But I reminded that group that 1.8 million trees is cleared every few days in the state for beef production. So if we continue to eat beef while planting trees, we're, we're joking, we're kidding ourselves. So that's, that's the thing that we must recognise. Some people, when they fly, they might tick a box that says offset my emissions. And what that does is the aircraft company plants trees to offset those emissions. But if you're on the aircraft and then you have a, the beef meal, for example, um, it's ridiculous. You, you're totally um, wiping out any benefit. We have actually released more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere through deforestation than from fossil fuels. The thing is, we can reverse that or, or most of that uh, by changing how we use the land. So when we deforest, we we use this incredibly effective tool called fire. What happens after that is that the above ground carbon is released and the below ground carbon continues to be released over the next 30 odd years. So when we cut down a forest and put cows on that land, we've immediately emitted all this uh, carbon. So we've stripped the carbon out of pretty much all the grazing lands on earth, which is 37% of the planet. We've stripped the carbon just by grazing animals. We've got to realize that yes, driving electric cars is a good thing, but the most impactful thing we can do is change our diet, particularly away from red meat and dairy. So that figure of 1.8 million trees is our ambition to plant being wiped out every few days in the state just for beef production is, is jaw-dropping. That's only new deforestation. It doesn't account for all the land that's already been deforested that could mm -hmm. regrow more trees. There's, there's a really interesting debate going on at the moment in science circles, and some are calling it the um, double climate dividend. You see, the, the land that we devote to grazing cattle and sheep, it's not just the extra deforestation that we do, it's also that land could be used for other purposes. And those other purposes could be habitat for wildlife, could be trees for drawing down the carbon. So they call it the double climate dividend. While ever you are growing cattle on the land, you are stopping the land from growing these other things, habitat and trees for carbon sequestration. So if you count that sequestration that's not happening as an emission, if you count that land's possibility of drawing down carbon, then suddenly animal agriculture becomes the greatest emission source on earth, greater than all the cars, all the trucks, all the fossil fuels, all the coal. If you count this double climate dividend, if you count that land, that, that sequestration that is not being that is not happening because we're using the land for red meat. So that double climate dividend is something that's starting to seep into some of the science literature. Most of us are blinkered in that we think, no, we can't change diet. That's an individual choice and you're not going to tell people what to do. But I believe that as we start hitting the brick wall, as we are already, you know, the climate's gone chaotic, blinkers will come off and we'll realise that we can use our planet in a different way. And overnight, almost, we can solve the, the crises of climate and biodiversity loss. The next biggest one is, is nitrogen pollution, which comes from farmed animals greatly. And that's causing three or four hundred dead zones in the ocean. Science there is terrifying. We are impacting life in the oceans, which is actually provides us with most of our oxygen and takes mm -hmm. in most of our carbon dioxide. And as we are changing those circulation patterns, the ocean is drawing in less uh, carbon dioxide and giving out less oxygen. And 
the people who've studied these things see that the oxygenation of the water is equivalent to what it was during the, the past great extinctions. So the ocean is dying and it's, it's got the same pattern as it had in the past extinctions. So we might be killing ourselves by the oceans as well. So how urgent is the issue of animal agriculture? This is the defining decade. Humanity can either set the path for a bright future or set the path for destruction. Now, at the moment, we're definitely well on the course of destruction. But I think we humans are slow, but not stupid. And when we can see that we have a, a way out of this, then we'll grasp them. And it might take a few uh, wildfires that burn down our homes. It might take floods that, that wipe out uh, cities. It might take sea level rise to make us come to our senses. But at the moment, the science is saying this is the solution, powerful, natural, low cost solution to our most pressing, pressing issues. But the thing is, unless we act this decade, I'm afraid. I've got six grandchildren and I'm afraid for their future. I'm afraid for the future of humanity if we keep going the way we are. But um, I'm still hopeful. And I believe it's because we humans will come to our senses. We're slow, but not stupid. What would you say to a person watching this that's thinking, if I go vegan, that's not going to change anything? There's, a, there's an old Chinese saying, you, you cannot change the world, but you can change yourself. And if you change yourself, you change your family. If you change your family, you change your village. If you change your village, you change your nation. And if you change your nation, you can change the world. So... Pulling that back, what can I do? What can each of us as individuals do that will have the most impact on a better future for our children? And the single greatest thing is to stop using the planet the way we're using it. It's to use it differently, give room for nature, give room for forests to draw down carbon dioxide. And the way to do that is on our plate every day. If we avoid red meat and dairy for a start, and then all meat, we will change the world. No question. Each one of us has that power in front of us every day. So there are other actions as well. If on a community level, tree planting is brilliant. On mm -hmm. a national level, we need a price on carbon so that the price of beef, for example, goes up and internationally, we can agree on carbon pricing so that we rebalance. These things are so simple, but they can be done. But it all starts with me, with you. What can we do? And we don't have to wait for government intervention. We don't have to wait for the beef producers to tell us, no, don't eat red meat anymore. We can do that. We can change ourselves. We can change our lives. We can change the world.